Thank you so much for that. That's great. Hi. Hi. So, this is a little deja vu since I was here last night, and some of you were as well, and many of you were not. So, it's uh, new and familiar at the same time. So, why don't we begin with a, a short sitting? I know short is relative. Um, it won't be, uh, it'll be around five minutes. So. something about that place of tranquility, but also interest, of relaxing, but also energy, that is at the heart of meditation practice. So they say even with our posture, we can feel some of that. If you can find a way to sit so that your back's straight, but not stiff, so that you're relaxed, but not so relaxed. <laughs> that your waist slumped over. And close your eyes or not, however you are most comfortable. Just let your attention settle on the feeling of your breath, just the normal, natural breath, wherever it's clearest for you at the nostrils, at the chest, or at the abdomen. You can find that place where it's strongest. Bring your attention there and just rest. See if you can feel one breath. You don't have to worry about what's already gone by. You don't have to lean forward for even the very next breath. Just this one. If you find that you spun out in a fantasy, you get lost in thought, your mind's jump to the past, jump to the future, judgment, speculation, don't worry about it. The moment that you realize you've been gone is considered the magic moment. That time is over, you're back, and in that moment we can gently let go and begin again. Just shepherd your attention back to the feeling of the breath.
And when you feel ready, you can open your eyes. <coughs> I usually like to start that way if I can because it's um, such a sense of arriving. And that gathering process is really what we've done just to get here, all the energy we've <coughs> expended and maybe rushing out of work or whatever you need to do to get here and then we can be really here in, in a much fuller way. So I, I spoke here last night, as I said, and I spoke um, this afternoon somewhere else. and. Uh, one of the things I've been thinking about has been a lot about just the nature of words, the nature of language, and how difficult it is sometimes to try to convey these ideas because really they're all about experience anyway. The first book that I wrote was called Loving Kindness, and it's about loving kindness meditation, and that's kind of an odd word for us. It's actually a translation of a word that in Pali, the language of the original Buddhist text is metta, M-E-T-T-A. And if you look at the literature, actually from the Insight Meditation Society, which is my center in Massachusetts, you'll see a photo of a large brick building with white pillars and this word up on top, metta. When we bought the building, it was a Catholic novitiate. Was, we moved in uh, Valentine's Day, 1976. And it was run by the Fathers of the Blessed Sacrament. So that's what it said up above the doorway, Fathers of the Blessed Sacrament. So we got someone to get up a very tall ladder and said, could you please rearrange those letters so that it says something about who we are and what we want to represent to the world. So they got up there and played around and they came up with metta. And there then ensued many, many discussions. You know, we're not in Asia anymore, no one understands this word. When I have a word people actually understand, that would be a good idea. Um, <laughs> but the point of view that actually wanted to keep it up there prevailed, and I was very happy because that was my point of view. I just like it when someone calls for directions and one of us picks up the phone and, and we say it's a large brick building with white pillars, it's got this word up on top, meta, and then the delivery person will say, what does that mean? <laughs> and we say that means love, or well, that means loving kindness. My concern about loving kindness as a word is that it is so unusual a word. You may not be in a downtown cafe and hear people at the next table having a conversation about loving kindness. And so then I think, well, maybe the quality itself will start to seem archaic and precious in the negative sense of the word and removed from day-to-day -day life, which it's not meant to be. Love, of course, is extremely complex a term. We can mean many, many things when we say love. Sometimes when we say love, we frankly mean a medium of exchange. Like, I will love you as long as. You love me in return. You say so in precisely this way. As long as the following 15 conditions are met. And I once used that example, actually. Uh, somewhere and someone raised their hand and said, only 15? <laughs> <laughs> so I will love you as long as however many conditions are met. I will love myself as long as I never make a mistake. You know, the fragility, the brittleness of that state is very familiar to us, but it's not what we mean by metta, which is something that is much more sustainable throughout our lives. And so my hope for a long time was that the word meta itself would enter the culture. Maybe, I don't know, 15 years ago at least, the writer Alice Walker was interviewed in the New York Times and they asked her about her meditation practice and she said, I do meta. So I thought, oh, that's it. <laughs> you know, now everyone is gonna use the word meta, which of course did not happen. <laughs> and just, I guess, last year, the basketball player Ron Artest from the L.A. Lakers, first he filed these papers to change his name to Meta World Peace. And there's a big media flurry, you know. Uh, you know, all these newspaper articles would start with, what is Meta? And I think, great, you know, here we are, it's gonna happen, and uh, it didn't happen. Uh, so, 
In a way, that's not bad because we can rely too much on the concepts and not remember the, the depth of our experience is really what it's all about. So I started my writing career, so to speak, writing loving kindness. And um, some years after that, I wrote a book called Faith, which I want to talk about some tonight, actually. I saw it last night, I don't know if it's still there. Um, and so you can imagine uh, the difficulty with that word. I wrote the book because I, I had a tremendous desire to explore the topic. And it was compelling, actually. And in a way, it was, it was difficult to know what to call that book because the word faith, for so many people, had overlays of being silenced, not being able to ask questions, having to believe something, not really counting on themselves, uh, all kinds of things. And that makes a lot of sense. But I wanted to try to chart a path of, of understanding different possible dimensions of that word and how it might be onward leading for us. In the Buddhist tradition, uh, faith isn't considered a commodity that we either have or we don't have. And if we don't have enough or we don't have the right kind, then we're going to be condemned. Faith is really a journey. And it's an interesting and powerful journey. It has different aspects to it. The word faith uh, actually means to offer your heart. To offer your heart to something, to someone. Something like that. So as depicted in, in the teachings of the Buddha, faith begins with what's called bright faith. It's an opening. It's usually an opening about ourselves, what we're capable of, how we're going to find meaning in life, joy we're capable of, what life is about. And the example is given of being in a, a small, dark, enclosed room, like a little room with the door shut, and you feel like that compression. No way out, nothing beyond that room. And then something happens, so the door swings open. And you go, whoa, it's a lot bigger. Life can hold a lot more, or I am capable of so much more than I had imagined. You don't know exactly what's on the other side, you just know something has really opened. So my favorite example of this actually uh, comes from a time about six years ago or something like that. Um, I was in Cleveland for a conference, and a friend and I went to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And we went to the Bruce Springsteen exhibit. And in the front of the glass of the Bruce Springsteen exhibit was a letter that he wrote upon Bob Dylan's induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So in the letter, Bruce Springsteen wrote about the first time he ever heard Bob Dylan's music said he was riding in a car with his mother, who was like 14 or 15 years old. And Bob Dylan's music came over the car radio. And Bruce Springsteen said, it was like a giant boot came down and kicked open the door of my mind. I thought, that's it, that's it. <laughs> it was like a giant boot came down and kicked open the door of my mind. And then he went on to say, and then my mother said, that man can't sing. <laughs> it's not that we will all get that same hit from the same thing, but I thought it was such a, a beautiful expression of what it feels like, like, wow, right? It's so uh, powerful and beautiful, it's likened to falling in love. It's just this amazing sense. But it's just considered the beginning. It's, it's not mature, it's not full blown, and it's shaky. For one thing, it could be very fickle. You know, maybe, let's say it's a teacher, you meet a teacher or something like that, um, that brings up that feeling. Maybe you meet one teacher one day and you think, wow, look at that, this is the way I'm gonna follow. And 
Then you meet another teacher another day, and you think, well, forget that other guy. You know, I'm going with this. This feels even better. Because that, that sense of things is not grounded in ourselves, in our own experience of, of what is true, of what can make us really happy. It's dependent on someone else. And even worse, in a way, or riskier, is the fact that because we feel so dependent on someone else, it could be a place, it could be a person, something, then often what happens is that we become afraid to ask questions. We don't want to rock the boat. We don't want any distance between ourselves and that seeming source of that amazing feeling of possibility. And so that's the place where what is called in the teaching bright faith can degenerate into what we commonly call blind faith, which will remain shallow and vulnerable and dependent on an external source, which is very, very risky. To continue on in the process According to the Buddhist teaching, oddly enough, the, the movement from bright faith to the next stage of faith, which is called verified faith, which is centered in our own experience, in our own knowing. The movement from bright faith to verified faith is basically a movement of doubt. Questioning, investigating, checking things out, finding out for ourselves. And so for me, one of the most beautiful and powerful statements of the Buddha ever was a very famous one where he said, don't believe anything. Don't believe anything because I said it. Don't believe anything because a great elder has said it. Don't believe anything because you've read it in the sacred text. Put it into practice. See for yourself what's true. So there's a lot of faith in that doubt, right? There's a lot of confidence in your own ability to see what's true. I think that's breathtaking. Instead of saying, just follow me forever, you know, don't ask any questions, he's saying, find out for yourself. Look at what that means about what we're capable of, to break through every convention and assumption and habit of mind and external cultural conditioning and to see for yourself what's true. That anyone can do that, not just the special people or the lucky people or um, whatever it might be, anyone can do that. That's amazing. It is breathtaking. So it's a certain kind of doubt that's talked about. Not doubt in oneself, but a real willingness to question and examine and investigate everything. There's another kind of doubt which is a little different than that. I used one example of it last night, actually, when in talking about my early practice, and that's more what's sometimes called skeptical doubt. We might call it cynicism, where instead of really trying something to see if it is for us or not, from the beginning we stand back and judge it. You know, we're not willing to try and come to a resolution or an evaluation from a deeper experience. Sometimes that's just fear, masquerading as doubt, like I'll never be able to do it. It's never going to work for me. Because that's a very hard thing to admit. It's much easier to say, not worth it. You know, it never works. Something like that. And so uh, those, are very, those are considered very different qualities. The one that has us question strongly and see for ourselves, and the one that has us stand back and feel isolated and excluded from a sense of possibility. One of my favorite stories actually about that second kind of doubt uh, is part of the legend of the enlightenment of the Buddha where they say that, um, of course, he got enlightened sitting under a tree, according to the legend, and then spent 49 days just in the vicinity of the tree doing seven things for seven days each. You know, they say he did walking meditation for seven days and he happily contemplated something for seven days. And uh, I think the sweetest one is that they say he gazed in gratitude at the tree for seven days for having sheltered him in his night of effort. And so seven things for seven days each. And so at the end of 49 days, he, he left the immediate vicinity of the tree and went walking to a nearby town. And uh, as many of you have probably heard this or read this, um, 
as the story goes, he came upon a man, I think a merchant, was the first person who saw him. So this is just 49 days after his enlightenment, and one presumes he's rather radiant. <laughs> and the, the merchant was incredibly struck by that. He said, who are you? Like, what are you? Are you some kind of celestial being? Who are you? And the Buddha so famously said in response, I'm awake. I'm an awakened one. And the guy said, yeah, maybe. And he walked away. <laughs> so that's the moment of skeptical doubt. <laughs> you know, the, yeah, maybe, I think is kind of good. <laughs> Actually, it's like, that's an outrageous statement. Why believe that? But why not hang out a while more and find, ask some more questions? Like, what do you mean you're awakened? Does it mean this? Does it mean that? Can anyone be awakened? Could I be awakened? What would I have to do to be awakened? Maybe I'll try that and see. That's very different than that kind of more dismissive <coughs> walk away doubt. You know, so that's something for each of us to explore. How much are we willing to try and test through the power of our own effort? compared to standing back. And that kind of questioning and putting something into practice does lead us to a much more grounded, centered, uh, steady kind of faith, because it's not dependent on someone else. It's coming from our own experience. And then just to finish the model, as that evolves over time, it's said to become uh, what's sometimes called abiding faith or verified faith, um, that, that becomes a, a more ultimate state. Abiding faith doesn't mean that it's like a belief that we hold, you know, like a, a trophy, and we denounce others um, by virtue of. It's, it's not like that. It means that we know something so deeply, we are it, we live it. There's no distance between how we are and what we know to be true. But it's very simple. It's not grandiose. It's not with <coughs> bells and whistles. You know, it's not with all these grandiose flourishes. I'm really uh, so struck here being in Tucson by how many Dalai Lama memories I have mm -hmm. because of the two times I came here uh, for him. And he is one of my favorite models of just this kind of abiding faith, you know, just that sort of simplicity. And one of my friends, when, when the Dalai Lama was uh, awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, somebody said, giving the Dalai Lama a Peace Prize is like giving Mother Nature an art award. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you just don't get that feeling that there's artifice there. You know, like, well, this person's incredibly boring, but I am the Dalai Lama, you know? It doesn't feel that way at all. It feels seamless. But that doesn't mean it's haphazard. I mean, he's the one who gets up at, I don't know, three every morning, you know, to practice for four hours before he begins his day or talks about his temper when he was a child. You know, it's not haphazard. But it's not artificial. It's not pretentious. So that's the um, latter stage of what is called faith. And I think that's very important for us. Um, you know, it's, it's not a quality that's easy for us to understand in our time, in this culture, to move from what could be a more cynical and self-doubting mode to a sense of being empowered, to try things out, to test them, to explore. And it comes down in the end to what is actually the title of my most recent book, which I also got into trouble for, which is Real Happiness. It's behind me, and it's bright orange cover. I wanted to write a book that was basically describing uh, some of the benefits, a little bit of the science about why one might meditate and do 
a, a more practical how-to section. And so um, some of you know this, the original title of the book was Why Meditate? Because that's actually what it's really about. And uh, I don't know, some time before it was going to be published, I received an advanced copy of Matthew Ricard's next book, which was called Why Meditate? <laughs> <laughs> so that took care of that. <laughs> My book was coming out in January. His book was coming out the September before. So there was a big scramble to try to find a title for the book. And the publisher of the book actually came up with Real Happiness which I was sort of torn about. <coughs> On the one hand, I thought, well, that's it. That's why we do these explorations. That's why we take some risks and step out of things we've been told will bring us happiness. And we're willing to check things out. And we're willing to look at our experience from lots of different angles. You know, see the love we're capable of, see the compassion we're capable of, see the awareness we're capable of. Otherwise, we'd just do nothing, right? If we didn't have some kind of urge toward a more abiding, stable, genuine happiness. But on the other side, I knew the words would be kind of problematic. The first um, problem I had as soon as the book came out was the word real. The very first interview I did about the book, the first question was something like, are you trying to say that the kind of happiness I experience having a lovely dinner with my wife isn't real? <laughs> and I thought, there it is. <laughs> and I said, as I genuinely believe, of course I think it's real. And if anything, we could be more grateful for those moments, those beautiful, wondrous moments, less distracted less sort of annoyed, because we're expecting something even better. We can be much more open, much more appreciative, much more grateful. Of course it's real, and we all know it doesn't last. I said to him, what about the night you don't like your dinner all that much? And I thought, but didn't say, what about the night you're not really getting along all that well with your wife? Because that happens too. So can we have a quality of happiness that's more sustained? That's not going to break. That's not going to shatter as we go through the inevitable ups and downs, changes, highs and lows of a day, of a life. <laughs> and I thought, well, maybe we should have called the book something like Durable Happiness. Which, <laughs> and then I decided, well, that's a terrible book title. It sounds like a tire ad or something. <laughs> <laughs> I began envisioning these covers with tires on tread marks. You know, <laughs> the cover, so. And then I went on tour with the book. This was um, a year ago, a little more than a year ago. and. I started getting into a lot of trouble about the word happiness, because I think we can have so much of an association with that word with superficiality and being conflict avoidant and unwilling to look at pain, and unwilling to look at difficulty, and just living in this kind of goo-goo, you know, made up, fanciful world. Um, it's very shallow. And people, as I was going on my book tour, were pointing things out to me like, do you ever see that bumper sticker that says, if you're not depressed, you're not paying attention? <laughs> <laughs> I say, yeah, I kind of have seen it. You know, thanks. Uh, and, and I understand it, actually. But we also do know when we are depressed, when we feel shattered, when we feel exhausted, when we feel overcome, there's not an awful lot inside of us we feel we can give to anybody else. That's not where generosity comes from. That's not where service comes from. That's not where an abiding sense of loving kindness or compassion comes from, because it's just not there. In, uh, again, in Buddhist teaching, when they talk about generosity, and this might not mean material generosity, although it could, um, material generosity is more taken as the example, because it's so concrete. We can understand it. They talk about the best kind of generosity 
coming from a sense of inner abundance. Because it's just so natural. And we kind of know that, right? That that spirit of generosity doesn't seem to really depend on the external amount someone has to give. There's something else going on. Because perhaps you might have, say, a fair amount externally by external measures, but you don't ever have the inner feeling of ever, ever having enough. And it's not that easy to give. And the same thing with our time, and the same thing with our energy, and the same thing with our gratitude, you know, saying thank you to somebody, or paying attention to them in an elevator, or, or whatever it might be. So that sense of inner abundance is like resourcefulness, resiliency, it's happiness in a certain sense of happiness. Not happy-go-lucky as we often take it to be, but, but really it's like resourcefulness. So then I thought oh, I should have called the book Durable Inner Resourcefulness. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went to the next city <laughs> and did it all over again. <laughs> so, We have to turn to our own experience to try to get a, a much deeper sense of, of these concepts, of these ideas. It's not a question of just adopting what someone else says and, and not questioning it, but of taking the ideas and seeing how they translate into our own experience. What does it mean to cultivate a quality of happiness that isn't so completely dependent on external circumstances. <laughs> Bring them in. Tell them to come. <laughs> so, and we know that. You know, and I don't. I don't want to ever imply that external circumstances are irrelevant. They're not irrelevant. They can be very impactful, in fact. But we also do know from our own experience that there's an inner reality that is also very powerful. You know, you can be in Hawaii in the most beautiful beach in the world with rainbows and loving friends surrounding you, and if you're depressed or you're frightened, you can't even, you don't even notice those people trying to reach out to you. You feel isolated, you're cut off. And we probably all know, or maybe it's ourselves, maybe it's someone else, someone who's been through great adversity, right? And even in that adversity, there's some sense of community, some sense of connecting to others, letting others help, or being able to be of help to others, or something intact in the matter of understanding, awareness, caring. So even though things may be very, very hard, and they genuinely are, it's also different because of the way we're receiving it. And to come to that understanding and, and to realize that, oh, things aren't so fixed, that we all do have a capacity to affect our relationship to everything, to pleasure, to pain, to everything in between, and that that matters. It's not kind of goofy and you know make believe in saying it's the only thing that matters in life, but it's extremely powerful, and we can do a lot in terms of how we relate to everything that comes our way. So. This is really the nature of meditation practice, is to have some amount of confidence and faith. It doesn't have to be a lot, but just some. That we might, in fact, have a capacity, each one of us, not just the other person. You know, or sometimes in New York City, people say to me things like, well, it's fine for the Buddha living under a tree, you know, 2,600 years ago in India. It's too bad I live in Manhattan. <laughs> where it's so noisy. <laughs> if only it weren't so noisy, then I could really meditate and I could get somewhere. You know, and that, that habit of 
deferring, like I'm left out, I'm on the sidelines, everyone else can do it, they've got what it takes, I can't do it. It's a very strong habit. But if we have enough confidence to say, I'm going to check it out, to see what it means for me, what happens to my life when I bring these values in, when I actually practice, that's the critical point. Because from then on, not instantly, you know, but given some time, then we have our life to look at, to see if in fact uh, our practice has made any difference. When I talk about meditation practice, it could be what we did earlier, the many, obviously many styles and techniques and methods. Tomorrow we're gonna go through a few of them. Um, but many of you probably already have, and you know, there are many opportunities to, to really explore uh, all of these methods. And the, the critical point is that it's not just a distant analytical exploration, it's, it's making it real, and then seeing what happens for you. So do you have any questions or comments, anything you'd like to talk about? We have a microphone. The Bodhisattva of communication will hand you the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here because of Tapper, I should say. <laughs> he sent quite a number of emails. <laughs> Came to see me in New York. <laughs> the first one was in 2008. <laughs> My assistant said, Who is he? <laughs> Sharon, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this, but as you were talking, I was thinking about um, that feeling, the essence of that feeling. And I just want to say that for me, it's a feeling of connectedness. And I, I don't know how to weave that into what you said. And I just wanted to make that comment, uh, or aside, or whatever you call it. <laughs> Thank you. First of all, it's very nice to see you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, boobies. what's that? We're fellow boobies. Yes, <laughs> we are. We last saw each other, uh, Peggy and I, in, in Washington, D.C., where the Dalai Lama was for 12 days uh, doing the Kala Chakra. It was kind of amazing. Um, I think connectedness is at the essence of everything because I think. Uh, you know, using that word, we're really talking about the fruit of wisdom. When we see clearly, when we see accurately, that's what we see. We see that we are all connected. And that we're connected to this bigger picture of life. And that um, because of that sense, which is true, one of the things I love about our time is that it isn't necessarily a spiritual understanding that brings us there. You know, um, economics brings us there. Environmental understanding brings us there. Even epidemiology brings us there. Like, um, did any of you see the movie Contagion? Yes. Yeah. A friend brought me to see it um, because he was a technical advisor on it. He brought me the opening in New York. And uh, he'd been a, a smallpox doctor, a doctor eradicating smallpox in India, you know, a long, long time ago. So he became a technical advisor on this film. And, and it was basically, you know, day one, someone has a really bad day in Hong Kong, like day four, half the earth is decimated, and it could happen. And it was the kind of movie where, like, if you sneezed, everyone around you. <laughs> <laughs> what have you got? You know, it's terrifying. This is true. Right? So, like it or not, for good or ill, our lives are incredibly connected. And we don't live in a time where people used to convince themselves, like, oh, what happens over there is going to stay over there. It's not going to ripple out over here, or what happens over here, what I devote myself to, the things I care about, the things I do. It's not going to matter over there, because it does. So that is the essence of a, a tremendous amount of understanding and wisdom. And things flow from there. 
a very natural kind of compassion. Not meaning you approve of everybody or that you give up taking a stand or you know having discernment. It's not like that. But it's just like everybody counts. I was teaching uh, well, for a series of years, I do teach in Washington, D.C. Uh, pretty commonly, and, and for um, a number of years, when I would go down to teach a whole day, as I'm going to do here tomorrow, there was a particular place where uh, the organizers would rent, because it was like a weekend. So it was a public school, an elementary school. And for years, they had all along the walls of the corridors their rules for kindness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, needless to say, when it was walking meditation time, everyone would go out and stare at the rules <laughs> for kindness. Both it was something to read and it was really great stuff. So, um, and it was things like, you know, respect everyone on the inside and on the outside. Things like that. But my very favorite rule was everybody gets to play. <laughs> And I thought, wouldn't it be a different world if that one principle was held to everybody gets to play. Everybody counts. Everybody matters. Our lives are all connected to one another. And so I think it's really, it's really pivotal. So. Sharon, it's great to have you back in Tucson again. Thank you. Um, given everything you've talked about so far, and given the, the uh, state of the world and the planet Earth at this point, could you say some things about uh, cultivating equanimity for us? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's an easy question. <laughs> well, equanimity is another one of those words. Um, that's very tough for us. I think it uh, can sound so much like indifference. Um, I'm going to build enough armor so that I'm not going to be touched by things. Um, I'm going to step back and not connect, not care. Caring hurts too much. Um, you know, so equanimity can sound like indifference or coldness or callousness or that kind of withdrawal. And it's not meant to be that at all. So it's tricky. You know, equanimity uh, really means spaciousness. It means balance. And it's the kind of balance that's born of wisdom. So it's different kinds of wisdom. Um, and I wouldn't say this is easy, but I would say it's essential, both internally and because of the nature of the world. Um, it's the balance that's born of wisdom. So wisdom brings us to it. Sometimes when we hear a word like equanimity, it also has a kind of coerced sense, like I'm not going to let myself care, you know. I'm, I'm going to force myself to be in this middle place where uh, I just won't feel anything anymore. But it's not like that. It's really like spaciousness um, because of wisdom. So. Wisdom might challenge some of our assumptions, like um, I, I'm in control of the universe. And therefore, if you don't get better fast enough, or you don't change your behavior in the way that I want, I failed. Or this is my timetable for change to happen. Or, you know, there are all those ways that we. Uh, very quietly think we should be in control <coughs> of the unfolding of events. And so needless to say, we suffer <laughs> because we're not. The alternative to that is an apathy, it's equanimity. It's trying and doing and being there and making the effort we make, but with wisdom. This will take the time it takes. I can't make it happen any faster through my impatience and my rage. I'm going to do everything I can possibly do, whether it's an individual or um, a, you know, a collective or an institution. I'm going to do everything I can do to try to bring about 
positive change. And I know, in the end, it's not in my hands. It is not my universe to control. I will do everything, but from a different place. Um, I used one example teaching this afternoon. Another example that comes to my mind is Ramdas, who was an old friend of mine, and many of ours. And um, he was in India when I first went to India at my very first retreat uh, in 1971. And uh, some years ago, of course, he had quite a, a massive stroke, and he wasn't expected to live. And then he recovered. And um, he is, by the way, for those of you who uh, have a TV, first of all, <laughs> and have cable, and have cable that includes Oprah's network, um, uh, she interviewed him. And it's going to be on April 22nd at uh, 11 o'clock Eastern. So I don't know exactly what time here. It's going to be, it's going to be OK. So it's, it's very exciting. But anyway, I went to see him. He was living in California at the time, um, pretty soon after the stroke. And uh, sitting in his living room was an amazing experience. It was, of course, fantastic to see him. And at the same time, um, there was an awful lot of stuff in the living room, stuff that people were sending him. And they were sending it out of love and a, a tremendous kind of wish for him to be well. <coughs> but in looking at some of those messages, you could just kind of tell the other edge. Like, take four drops of this and you will definitely be walking in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a kind of pressure there. And all I could think of was, what if he's not? Are you going to hang in there with him? Are you still going to love him? Are you still going to care? Or one of the things I think that is most difficult for us to tolerate as a feeling is a sense of our own powerlessness and lack of control. It's very hard for us. And so if you think about the situations you have fled from, just look at how much of that may have been involved. Rather than, you know, I'm not saying don't offer the drops or whatever it was, but we can look at where we're coming from. Because sometimes it's not just a freely given gift. There's, there are other layers of things. And also when I was there, this big package came of Ganges water, water from the Ganges River <laughs> in India. And it said exactly that. It said something like, you know, take 15 drops a day and you'll definitely be walking in two weeks. <laughs> and I said, don't drink that. <laughs> you know, like, whatever you do, do not drink that. You'll get cholera. <laughs> but, you know, so it's not that easy. Of course, it's very hard, but, and it's both. I mean, it was, genuine love and compassion and wishing for him to be well. And sometimes it felt like there was something else as well. You know, that actually was impeding the reception of the gift rather than enhancing it. And so that's where we need equanimity is, is you know, one can examine, and we do actually, generosity and service in that light. And that sort of helps us. I think, understand our own efforts in a lot of other domains. What's it like when we give a gift? <coughs> Pretty impatiently waiting to be thanked, you know? <laughs> What's it like when we just give a gift? And, and so on. So. Equanimity. Testing, testing, yes. Um, my voice is a bit hoarse right now. Um, this is my first time actually hearing you speak. You're a uh, wonderful orator, and uh, thank you for coming to Tucson again. Thank you. <laughs> um, but first off, saying that Nobel Peace Prize to the Dalai Lama, hilarious, <laughs> for one. Um, yeah, in my own personal experience, um, I was raised Southern Baptist in Houston, Texas, of course. And when I went back home, as a group, 
the, my family members actually came to me about six or seven. They said, hey, how you doing? I know you spent some time in Asia, and uh, so how was it? It's like, oh, it was actually very, very awesome. I um, saw a lot of monasteries, a lot of, uh, a lot of how different cultures actually go. And I was thinking about um, you know, converted Buddhism. I said, really? Have you ever saw the of your life? Like, what happened? Thing is, so it's like something that was um, they're trying to take my soul away from me, and um, and that was when you talked about blind faith, mm-hmm. actually the faith without um, asking questions about um, what if or what not or mm-hmm. you know anything on the outside, and I doubted a little bit, you know, in, in myself, like well. I was mm-hmm. on this track for a long time and actually did really well. But then I looked back at it and saying that, well, what if this story wasn't true? What if this actually happened? It's like, oh, well, it did happen because it said the book. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it is nothing, you know, bad about my family or anyone mm-hmm. that believe mm-hmm. in that type of religion because as long as you do well and you try to do well by others, it's like mm-hmm. more power mm-hmm. to you. Mm-hmm. And when I started talking to them and when I recentered myself and started meditating, I came back to them with an answer that I could give them at the time, uh, one at a time. Because ganging up on someone, you know, seven or eight people, you know, having a shared mind, you know, their focus is straight. But um, as an individual, you could, you can talk and, mm-hmm. and just have so much more, um, you know, individual thought and look inside yourself more than you can look into a collective mind. Mm -hmm. And then from that, from then on, when I talked to each one of them separately, you know, that was actually, took a few few days, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, they started understanding where my mind was Mm -hmm. and they understood it. And he said, well, can you still celebrate Thanksgiving and Christmas? I was like, sure. <laughs> sure. And um, I guess in a roundabout question, uh, roundabout way, my question is, when a, co- when a collective mind is broken down into smaller groups or individuals, um, how do you believe that the world can actually become closer together mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and be, you know, um, and closer connectivity, although we've, as human beings, have drawn those battle lines and it mm-hmm. cannot be crossed mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. as groups, mm-hmm. but as individuals, mm-hmm. we, we can toe that line. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like, how do you think that um, we can actually get mm-hmm. to that point mm-hmm. without, um, I guess, somewhat betraying what mm-hmm. we believe in? Mm-hmm. Well, I, you know, I would never want to imply any of this is easy, because I think that would be rather glib. Um, but I think there is a level of connectivity that isn't about how we understand things, or the belief we hold, or the sense of self and other, or us and them. It just is. You know, that we share this planet, we um, share this life, that what we do ripples out. So whether somebody sees things in accord with that or not, it's just the way it is. And so um, I think there are ways people can come together on different levels. It's like collective action for the common good, whether it's a neighborhood, you know, or family, or community that doesn't necessarily evoke uh, a belief system, you know, which has gotten us into trouble forever (laughs) as people. Um, you know, so that's sort of what we look for. It's what we look toward, is is ways we can relate, not from a doctrinal place, but uh, from a sort of genuine place of connection. Because if you know the um, rains don't come, for example, this year, then everyone in that neighborhood is going to be affected, right? So we need to take care of one another, we need to help one another, and see what evolves from that. Um, 
But in a matter of communication, of course, it's very difficult. And oddly enough, it can be even harder with the people we're closest to in terms of family. You know, once I, um, I went to see the Dalai Lama, I think it was in Seattle, actually, and I walked in and he was giving a lecture and I found it like absolutely hilarious. He said, um, he was saying something like, Perhaps it's not that skillful to say it's warm in the room because maybe not everyone is feeling warm. Perhaps it's more skillful to say I am feeling warm. And I thought, oh my God, he sounds like every communications coach from California I've ever heard. <laughs> Use I language, not you language. Thought, Who's he been talking to? And I thought, maybe he's been talking to communications coaches from California. He likes talking to all these people. And yet, isn't it so? Like if you go to the movies with a friend and you, you leave together, you walk out together and the friend says, that was the best movie ever made. There's now no room in the universe <laughs> for you to say, I didn't like it that much. <laughs> but if the friend were to have said, I loved that movie, there is still room in the universe for you to say, wow, I had a really hard time with it. And then there's communication. Mm -hmm. So even though these things sound so cliched and they're formulaic and like use I language and not you language, it's actually a skill. You know, we can't instill the skill in others, but we can work on our own to have those skills of, of communication and connection, you know, which, which we genuinely can do. So that helps. Well, thank you, Sharon. Where are you <laughs> Thank you. The next few yeah, minutes, Sharon charge. will be uh, down here signing books. Yeah. If you'd like to learn about uh, some place to learn and practice meditation in Tucson, yeah. Linda over there, okay. that's Linda. Linda can tell you about the Tucson Community Meditation Center. And if you're kind of nerdy and would like to learn about uh, scientific research on meditation in Tucson, um, come talk to me. I'll be in the lobby and we'll both have a way you can sign up for our listeners. Thank you all so much for coming. Maybe we'll see you tomorrow. Well, tomorrow's going to be in the same room. Uh, we'll start at 9 o'clock and we'll break from 12 to 1 for lunch. Um, there's a whole bunch of restaurants a couple blocks from here. Uh, or, of course, you can bring your own food. So register for tomorrow. And there is space open for tomorrow. So if this was so great that you want more, please come back tomorrow and bring your friends as long as they are nice. <laughs>